Cleaning and lubricating your mountain bike goes without saying, but there are a lot of different oils and cleaning products available on the market, which can make things a little bit confusing when you're trying to figure out what you need. So today, we're gonna to take you through what you actually need to clean and lubricate your bike, and we're also gonna delve into the more advanced mechanical world, where we look at things like anti-seize compounds, thread locks, press fit retaining compounds, suspension oils and lubricants, and all the things that you're gonna need when you start considering taking on bigger maintenance jobs. Okay, so I just wanna be clear about this from the beginning. If all you're doing is quite literally cleaning and lubricating your bike and you're just doing it as and when it needs being done, then really you can get away with the bare minimum. There's no problem with that. However, if you're taking on more advanced and specific jobs, there are several products available on the market that are really, really good for the job. They'll make the job easier and you'll get a much better result. There's also longevity and performance to take into account, something that we will tackle when we get to the relevant products. But let's start at the beginning with the absolute essentials, the things you need to clean, protect, and lubricate your bike. Okay, so let's get going with the basics first. Now, we all need to clean your bike and lubricate the chain at the very least. So think about this as a three-part process. Cleaning, protection, and lubrication. So you're gonna need something to clean your bike and clean your transmission with. You'll need something to protect it. That means driving out the moisture so no corrosion can happen. And then you're gonna to need to lubricate it by having some sort of lubricant on the chain. Now let's look at the bike cleaning products first. Now, and before I talk about the specifics, let's deal with the elephant in the room first, shall we? The household products and the car products available out there, because I know a lot of you will always ask these questions. Now first up, washing up liquid, two ways. A lot of people say, yeah, you can use washing up liquid, it doesn't harm your bike, does a great job and it's cheap. And a lot of people say, oh, you shouldn't use washing up liquid, it's full of salt and that can corrode your bike really badly. Okay, so yes, you're right, washing up liquid does have um, a fair bit of salt in it, but also so do dedicated bike cleaners. They all have salt in them. That is not the reason you shouldn't use that stuff though. There's other reasons. Now, without getting into different brands here, it's a minefield of different things. Wash out liquids generally are designed as a detergent to lift off and soften sort of grime and food basically to get it off your plate. As a result, they can leave things leaving quite good, but they can also leave a shiny residue. So um, really don't want to mess with any residue on a bike because it can interfere with your brakes, it can make your paintwork look streaky, all sorts of stuff like that. You're not guaranteed a good finish basically, but yeah, all right, you could get away with using washing out liquid. As for car shampoo, yeah, you can get a great result with car shampoo because that's designed for taking the salts of the road off, um, roadkill, like, you know, dead flies and things like that, and all the sort of braking grime that you get around your wheels, you know, that black, horrible, powdery stuff that you, you get that comes off the brakes. Um, yeah, car shampoo will do a great job, but beware. A lot of car shampoos have other ingredients in them, like polishes and waxes. They're designed to give a great finish on your car but they can also play havoc with your bike and really mess with your brakes. So just be cautious around using that stuff, but technically, yeah, you can use that stuff, but it's not gonna be as good as a dedicated bike cleaner. Bike cleaners are formulated to be kind to your bike. They're not gonna affect things like your brakes and they're not gonna affect paintwork, which is especially important if you've got a really posh carbon fiber bike or you just wanna take care of your pride and joy. Best advice is to get dedicated products for that dedicated purpose. Bike cleaner's great, and you can also get refills for this stuff. Uh, this one's muck off, and with the refill, you can get four times the amount to concentrate. So you can fill up that four times with an extra bottle of this stuff, uh, which is great because it avoids using up that packaging. Um, that's what we like to see, a bit more eco-friendly. Now, you might also want to consider something to clean your transmission with, some sort of chain cleaner or some sort of degreaser. There's a few options available in the market. I've got a spray version here, and I've got a pouring option that also comes with a spray handle. Now the pouring one is my favoured preference because I do like to use things a bit different. I like to pour directly onto a brush and agitate it myself uh, and sometimes pour it into a cleaner as well as having the ability to spray it on. However, the aerosol ones are actually really aggressive and you can actually use less of this stuff to better effect, um, but it's not generally the way I like to work. This has got to suit the way that you want to clean your bike. This stuff, you can spray it directly onto the chain and literally you can watch it turn into what looks like a brand new chain. It's quite incredible, but it's very, very vicious stuff. Needless to say, you shouldn't get these anywhere near your braking surfaces because of the fact they can affect them. 
Next up comes the protection part of the process. Now this really is talking about getting any moisture away from your bike that can corrode stuff. So you're looking at some sort of product that's a corrosion inhibitor. There's lots of different options available on the market. I like to use Bike Protect. This stuff is a corrosion inhibitor and actually you can get a good, almost a polishing effect with it. It's a bit of a dual purpose thing to use on a bike. But you can also get other ones like this one and various other ones on the market that have actual lubricants in them as well. So not only can you drive out that moisture, but you can leave a bit of lube on there as well. So that's really good stuff to use in things like shifters, to use in your uh, derailleur cabling, stuff like that to make sure it runs nice and smoothly. Even around moving components like pedals and derailleurs, it's good stuff to use. And that a push. You could use that as a chain lube, but it's very thin and it's not going to stay in place that well for reasons that I'll talk about with the chain lubes in a minute. But as an all-purpose lube, it's great. It's also great for stopping creaky doors around the house as well. Uh, and also for using on other things like uh, the cleats on the soles of your shoes, uh, because of the fact it's a corrosion inhibitor and the lube, it's going to make them work nicely with your pedals and stop them getting rusty. So kind of a good product there to use. And last up, the actual lubricants themselves. Now you get two main types, wet and dry. Now both of them are wet, but this is where it comes into effect. The wet lube is thicker. It's designed for use in wet conditions and it's much thicker, stays on the chain to repel water away. Now that's the secret to how it works. The downside is if you were to use wet lube in dry, dusty conditions, all the mud, muck, grime, dust and stuff is gonna stick to your chain. That turns into like a grinding paste and wears everything out that bit faster. So not the nicest stuff to use, but for out and out wet conditions and foul conditions, you really need that stuff because it stays in place much longer. Dry lube technically is wet, but the wet part is just a solvent carrier with the particles of lubrication that floats within it. It's designed so you can get the floating particles to get to their place, and then that carrier will evaporate, leaving a dry finish, hence the name dry lubricant. It's great for use in dry conditions because there's nothing sticky on the chain afterwards, so nothing sticks to it, which means the chain runs nice and smoothly in those conditions. The downside though, is if you're using wet conditions, it hasn't got that thick, wet liquid feel on the top of it that repels the water. So those lubricating particles can basically wash straight out of the chain, leaving you with a dry chain, um, something that you don't want either. So you do actually need both in your collection to deal with different conditions. Uh, really, that is the basics of what you need. Something to clean your bike with, something to drive out the moisture, and something to lubricate the chain. But let's go a little bit deeper and we'll look at all of the much more specialist products designed to help you do the best possible home maintenance jobs. First thing I wanna talk about is an additional cleaning product. This is a waterless wash. This is great for life on the road when you're at events and you can't really clean your bike, but you need to get it cleaned. Also, if you live in a flat or something like that, it's a great alternative to having to do a full wet wash, i.e. with a bucket of water and a brush and that stuff. Uh, I made a video about dry cleaning your bike using products like this. There's gonna be a link to that in the description underneath this one. So uh, it's an additional product, but it, it might be useful for you. So definitely worth considering. The next start by, by having a look at some more advanced lubricants. Now I showed you a minute ago wet and dry lube. These are fantastic and they'll serve most riders fine. But if you're looking for something a bit higher performance, look at the ones that got ceramic particles in. They last a bit longer because they basically stay in place longer without wearing and washing and moving away. Okay, so they cost a bit more, but they last a bit longer. There's a trade-off there. Uh, definitely slightly higher performance from using ceramic-based lubricants. Now, you might also hear about wax-based lubricants. Uh, more popular in road cycling because of the nature of there's, well, there's no dust and grit to get in the way, really. Um, if you ride in conditions where you can stay exceptionally clean on the bike, then a wax-based lube might be a good alternative to a dry lube. But let's face it, for most mountain bikers, a traditional wet lube and a dry lube are really your bread and butter. They're the things you need to look after your drivetrain. Okay, so next up, let's talk about grease, because there's loads of different options here. Now, just before we delve into them, uh, we'll run you through the main types you tend to see out there. So there's lithium grease, there's Teflon grease, there's generic workshop grease, and there's high performance grease. Now, lithium grease, I don't actually have one in front of me because I don't use this stuff. Um, it's the cheapest of the greases. It's white or a sort of light gray in color. You tend to see it used in big tubs in workshops. Now, this stuff is fine for installation purposes, for using underneath bearings, sitting into bearing cups and frames, things like that, but it doesn't last that long and it can sort of um, turn into a gunk after a while, so don't tend to see it as much in the mountain bike world. Teflon grease, though, is incredible on bearings because it uses PTFE or polytetrafluoride ethylene. Um, it's incredibly slick stuff, but 
you can't really use this around carbon. So it becomes a bit more of a specialist grease just for using on things like bearings. Next up is a generic workshop spec grease. So you're talking something like this or something like this. Now this sort of grease is fine for use on most things around the bike. Uh, note that this one is a bio-friendly one. Uh, this is a conventional workshop spec grease, both of which are carbon friendly. So that is something that you might want to consider. If you're just going to buy one grease, get a generic grease. But my advice would be make sure it's carbon friendly. Um, tends to be the ones that are more petroleum based or not so carbon friendly, uh, but they tend to state on the actual packaging, if you say, it says uh, carbon fiber safe. So you wanna make sure you look for that. This stuff can be used on bearings, it can be used on seat posts, it can be used on pedal threads in a number of places around the bike, but it's your generic grease and that will become your go-to. Then of course, there is the high performance grease. Uh, high performance grease here, similar sort of packaging as you might see. Uh, it costs quite a bit more. So ergo, you probably don't want to use this in other areas on a bike. Technically, you can use it anywhere. You can use a generic grease. It just costs a lot more. It tends to only come in smaller amounts, whereas workshop grease, you can get them in whack and great tubs the size of this sort of thing here. High performance grease is designed for using on precision ground bearings, um, ceramic bearings, anything that's a bit more exotic. This also tends to be uh, friendly to use on suspension components as well. Now this stuff is really good um, but you won't always need it on your bike. A generic grease is really the one. That's your bread and butter as far as that's concerned but if you're lucky enough to have something say a set of Chris King hubs then you probably want to reflect the performance of those hubs with a high performance grease to go along with that. Now just before we move on to the other specifics I just want to say something very important about grease that's often not communicated. Now use grease on threaded parts of the bike because essentially, uh, well, as well as making it easier to thread the components in and easy to remove them afterwards so they won't corrode in place or get stuck, it also enables you to reach the correct torque setting. Now we often refer to torque settings on bicycle components because some of them are quite delicate and you can actually end up breaking components, crushing handlebars, snapping bolts or snapping uh, components like delicate things like stem clamps, for example, by over torquing them. Now, if you're using a dry bolt against a dry thread and you thread it in and you try and read it with a torque wrench, you're going to get a very inaccurate reading. It'll probably be a lot looser than it's supposed to be. If you use a grease, you're going to achieve the correct torque because there's going to be no resistance against that. So that's really important to say, especially in applications where it's so important, i.e. a stem clamp is a prime example. So make sure you use a bit of grease when you're tightening those up sufficiently. Okay, next up is anti-seize compound. You get different styles. This is a traditional anti-seize compound, and this one is a copper compound. Uh, this one might seem a bit more, uh, you might have heard of copper slip and copper compounds before. They're very common. Now these essentially have a non-reactive metal in them, copper basically, and they're designed for use in places on bike where you tend to have more exotic materials that can react together. Perfect example might be a titanium frame with a threaded bottom bracket shell, and you need to put an alloy cup into there. Now those two metals can react and bind and seize together. You do not want this to happen. Now you can get away with using a regular grease, but grease over time can wash away and not achieve the same effect. If you really want to be sure about things, use a dedicated anti-seize compound. It really is much better for that application. Next up are assembly compounds or carbon gripper. Now this is essentially a carbon safe grease with particles suspended within it. it feels quite gritty to the touch, uh, almost a bit like um, a slightly wetter Swarfiga type of stuff. Now the job of this is essentially to lower the clamping force needed to stop things like a carbon bar rotating or creaking within a handlebar clamp itself. Now it can be very easy to over tighten them and hence uh, over torque or crack bolts, snap bolts, crack the stem plate or even worse crush your expensive carbon bar. Using some of this stuff is a no brainer. It means you can torque things up nice and safely. The bar is not gonna move. You're not gonna damage it, it's carbon safe. Uh, and more importantly, it's not gonna creak as well. So having some kind of carbon compound if you've got any exotic stuff on your bike is a great idea. But don't mistake this for grease that you can use in places with carbon components. This is only to use to clamp things. It's not to use as a lubricating grease, i.e. on bearings or like in a headset, something like that. Because you think what that sort of gritty stuff on the inside that's gonna do, it's actually gonna wear everything out. So this is only for assembly purposes. 
Uh, last up, before I move on to suspension greases, are any weird specialist greases out there? Now, these tend to be recommended by manufacturers of very specific products. Uh, this one is a DT special grease, it even says special grease, um, for DT wheels. I don't even have any of their wheels, but it's actually designed for the ratchet system on the inside of the hubs. Uh, it's a grease, so it stays in place, but it's very thin. So it doesn't congeal, it doesn't stop it doing its action. I've said in the past, I prefer to use oils on hubs instead of using greases because of that exact fact, but this stuff is specially designed for their hubs. Now you might find with any number of bicycle components, in particular high-end ones that can be quite finicky with how you look after them, uh, they might recommend you use a very specific product to look after it. If they recommend it genuinely, it could be for good reason. So just take note of that. Suspension grease. Right, so there's lots of different options available here. Uh, some for internal components. For example, this one here is dynamic seal grease. This is designed for the seals on the inside of a rear shock. It's quite thick, it's designed to stay in place. Uh, there isn't really anything else like that. But then you've got this stuff. This is SRAM butter, also seen in a syringe here. It's a very thin suspension grease, uh, similar to this stuff here. Uh, and also this stuff that I've got in this tub here. There's loads of different options of suspension grease out there. And essentially they're very thin, very, very slick greases that are designed to be used on moving suspension surfaces around the seals and on the stanchion tubes there to help them really slide in and out of that fork. You can't use a big, thick, generic grease. It's just too thick. It will congeal and attract loads of the wrong sort of stuff that you want on a suspension fork. So if you're gonna be caring for suspension forks by doing a lower leg service, you will need some kind of dedicated suspension grease. Now, if that's not up your street and you just wanna do a bit of maintenance on the outside of the fork, then some suspension lubricant is what you need. And we'll get to that shortly, but just be sure if you're working internally on suspension products that you get the relevant product for that. Now, some manufacturers will recommend a specific one, uh, but generically, you're gonna be fine with them. The most important thing though is to definitely use these over regular greases because of the fact they're not gonna be damaging to seals and they're not gonna be so thick that they actually hinder the performance of them. I think it's telescopic forks, so you want the action to be as slick and smooth as possible. Okay, so let's get into some of the more specialist oils available for your bike. Uh, we're gonna start with suspension lubricant because we followed on from the grease a minute ago. Now you can get dedicated suspension lubes which are designed to put just under the seals or just on top of the seals and you can ingest them into a fork by compressing them. And that basically makes your initial action of that suspension fork especially supple. Now this stuff is really, really good. Uh, I recommend anyone that's willing to look after their bikes to get some dedicated suspension lubricant to use on a bike. And you can get two main types of that. You can get the spray on stuff and you can get the stuff that's in a more oil-based format. Now I tend to use the oil-based stuff because I do like to take my suspension apart. However, if that's not really your bag, you might wanna look at one of the sprays. Now this is actually a universal spray silicon based. So that means it's safe for using on suspension components, but it's also a bit of a polish as well. So uh, multi-use, you can use it on other components. But something to note is if you are using any sort of spray on your bike, and this applies to all sprays, make sure you have a rag behind to catch the mist when you're doing it. Take note of the fact that a suspension fork, obviously you've got a disc brake very close to that. Uh, you get this stuff near your disc, your brakes are not gonna be working very well for a very long time, so do take care with that. Um, as an upside though, this stuff is amazing for a bunch of different things. It's essentially polish. You can use it on the dashboard in your car. You can use it on a whole number of things on your bike. It smells really nice to boot. But if you're gonna go for the inside of the fork, then you'll want something a bit more lubricant place to put it in in the actual correct position. However, the spray lube and the actual bottle lube does a very good job of the same essential thing of making that initial action of your fork feel nice and supple. Now for the rear shock, there are some specific ones. Now Fox actually supply float fluid for their ones. In fact, I've got a bigger one floating around here somewhere but you can buy it in bigger containers as well. If you're taking apart your rear shock, uh, you will need some seal grease, as I showed you a minute ago, but you will also need a, a few drops of this. It's literally, it's not much, hence they supply them in these tiny little things. Uh, and it makes a significant difference to the small bump sensitivity of your rear shock. Again, so if you're doing an air can service on a shock, you will definitely want to consider something like that for yours. And last up with the suspension related oil is the actual suspension oil itself. Now this isn't generally lubricating oil, we're talking about stuff to put inside the dampers. You get different types and different weights. Uh, the 20 weight is actually ideal for using as a lower leg lubricant on the inside of your forks. That's the bath 
at the bottom there. As the forks compress, this stuff lubricates the bushing so it helps the fork slide up and down. This stuff you can use on the upper legs of the fork like you would with the lubricant, but obviously in a bottle like this it can be very hard to actually apply that, so something smaller would be needed. Uh, you obviously get different weights of oil for different fork setups. You get 20 weight, you get six weight, you get loads of different options available, and depending on what yours is, uh, you might want to stock up. I've got various different weights for different forks and different purposes. Now from time to time, you're gonna to need to bleed the brakes on your bike if you've got hydraulic disc brakes, in which case you're gonna need the relevant oil. And there's two main types, there's dot oil, and there is mineral oil, of which you obviously have to observe the correct type for your brakes, that is paramount. So dot oil stands for Department of Transportation, you get dot four, and you get 5.1 on mountain bikes. And then you get mineral oil. Now you get different branded mineral oil and they are all slightly different. So you really should be sticking to the recommended one for your brakes. Shimano oil for Shimano brakes, Magura oil, which is blue for Magura brakes, etc. They are slightly different formulas. Now these are non-regulated, so they're very different to the regulated ones uh, as regulated by Department of Transportation. These are to certify that they work in very specific conditions, but it's a very different oil. We'll get to the mineral one in a second, but something to note with the dot stuff is only keep the amount that you absolutely need in your workshop and keep it sealed until you use it. The reason for this is dot oil actually ingests on a microscopic level water into it over time and that reduces its efficiency at temperature. So uh, by having moisture inside the oil, it's gonna have a lower boiling point. And basically the whole point of dot fluid is it keeps a consistent boiling point. You do have to replace your oil from time to time. Like on motor vehicles and stuff, it can be like every couple of years, or depending on how much mileage you do on them. And really with your bike, it's the same because the oil does degrade over time. If I were to bleed my brakes with some of this and screw the lid back on and put it back on the shelf, over time that will ingest a small amount of water into it and it won't really be fit for purpose. You'll have to recycle the oil. My advice would be if you do have any and you've say you've got one or two bikes, maybe you've got three if you're lucky, um, if they all have dot brakes on them, when you go to bleed them, bleed them all. Basically you do all of your brakes in a hit, make use of that oil, otherwise it will go off. Now mineral oil doesn't go off, so you can afford to keep it in a larger supply. Uh, in fact, I think all of my bikes currently have mineral oil on, uh, hence me having this whacking great pot Shimano stuff. Now it's great because it doesn't absorb moisture and it's unregulated, so some people may raise their eyebrows um, of this, but actually Shimano and many of the other brands like Magura see this as a positive thing because they can design an oil that works harmoniously with their braking system. So arguably they can control the quality of it even more so than using a stock dot oil. Uh, that's not to suggest that these are different qualities of oil, this is just to say they're two different operating systems, both of which work exceptionally well on mountain bikes. Just make sure you have the correct ones. Now, you will also need some sort of disc brake cleaner. Now I didn't put this in with the cleaning products earlier because it's a very specific product to use around brakes. Now they have all sorts of different ingredients including isopropyl alcohol. That is one of the key ingredients that helps it evaporate afterwards. Now even if you think your disc brakes aren't dirty, when riding on mountain bike trails, quite often you'll get oil in the mud, and oil that's come off transmissions of other riders, uh, even off motorbikes and other trail users. And in time, that stuff works its way onto your brakes. If your brakes have been squealing in the past, they've become discolored, it's quite often from contamination. It might not be from your brakes. So you will need some of this to clean those disc rotors with and the disc pads, uh, leave it basically to sort of evaporate afterwards. And also, if you're bleeding and working on your brakes, the chances are you will get some of this oil around the surfaces of your bike, and you'll need this to clean it off because you can't always see it afterwards. And when you wipe it with a rag, you don't necessarily see it then as well. And dot in particular can be quite aggressive on your paintwork, so make sure you keep some of that if you're gonna be working on brakes. There is one last product you might wanna consider if you're working on brakes, but this is very specialist, and this is a dot compatible grease. Now you think that dot is quite corrosive as far as oils go. It's obviously safe inside the braking systems. That's what it's designed for. But if you were to use, say for example, grease the pistons on a set of dot brake compatible calipers, then the oil actually will get rid of that grease. It will perish it basically. So if you're rebuilding a set of brake calipers, you will need some of this stuff. Look at the color of that. That stuff is designed to withstand use under dot oil. But again, that's pretty specialist to be able to take apart your brake calipers and grease the pistons on, but that is a job that does need doing on some bikes at some point if you want the ultimate performance. So 
if that's the name of the game, then get yourself some of that as well. Okay, next up are thread locks and retaining compounds. So, thread lock, this blue one is the mountain biker's friend. Loads of different brands on the market, uh, but the blue one is medium strength. That is the one that you really wanna be using on mountain bike components. You can use it on the grub screws on your pedals to stop them rattling out. You can use it on chaining bolts if it's really that much of an issue that yours come loose. You'll notice when you have a set of disc brakes on your bike, when you take the rotor bolts off, you'll notice that there will have been blue thread lock on those. A safety thing to stop the bolts uh, coming off, essentially. Now, this is the one you wanna use. You can also get a red high strength one. Now, I never really use this on bikes, and really, that's more like a glue than it is like a thread lock. So, unless there's something that you're really struggling with that can come loose, um, annoying times, like maybe a bit of pivot hardware on a bike, something like that, that doesn't really tend to come out, I would avoid using it. I would stick to the medium strength. That is more than adequate for most jobs. Now there is another product you will need if you have a press fit bottom bracket on your bike and that is a press fit retaining compound and the primer on which you need to use with it. Now you could use anti-seize compound, you could use grease for installing a bottom bracket. There's various different schools of thought on this. However, if you have too much grease and you don't install it correctly, there is a chance that the bottom bracket shell itself can walk within the frame. Now when it walks within the frame, not only does the fit get worse in time, that is where creaks start. Now if I'm going to install a press fit bottom bracket to any bike, I will always use a retaining compound. This is the nearest thing to putting it in in a permanent basis. But you can't just use this on the frame and on the shell because it can create an almost permanent bond that you can't break without damaging components. So you don't want to damage your frame. So if that's the case, then make sure you use a primer. Use the primer on the shell itself and use the primer on the surface of the bearing there. And the idea is that will get damaged when you remove it afterwards, not the actual retaining compound. This stuff is brilliant and I've never had a bottom bracket creak that I've used this on. That really is the key in my eyes. Okay, the last real thing is the ultimate word in detailing, um, polish. Now, if I mention frame polish, in a GMBN office, I get more than a few raised eyebrows. Now, I think it's safe to say that most of us at work are too busy just trying to get your bike clean and protected and lubed and then back out on the trails again. However, I'm aware, and I've got a lot of friends that do this, there's a lot of you out there that will love all the finer work on your bikes. Perhaps you do that already on your car. Perhaps you've got all the little products, you know, for uh, polishing up the sidewalls or the tires, cleaning your dashboard, all that stuff. You will definitely appreciate the same principles in the, in the bike world, really. Now, there's a few different options available to you. Now, I mentioned the Silicon Shine earlier. This is my preference for all of these, to be honest, because of the fact it's a versatile product. You can use this on the stanchion tubes on your bike to help the suspension forks feel a bit better. And I can also pull out some of that dust. It smells amazing and works great as a polish. Um, it doesn't necessarily stop loads of mud and muck sticking to the bike, but it does make it a lot easier to clean it afterwards. So uh, there's definitely merits to using this stuff. But also, it's really good as a general polish. Um, I actually use this stuff around the house. I use it on the dashboard of the car. It smells great and it works for that purpose. But it's not quite as good as a dedicated polish. So you've got this stuff, which is much more in line with what you see in the car world. It's got kind of a wax in it. Um, it's a really high-end finish. So if you've got anything resembling some kind of super bike, like a Yeti, a Santa Cruz, uh, anything that's like a carbon fiber beauty of a bike, then perhaps you might want to look at something like this because the finish you can get on them is insane. Now, if you've got a bike that's got a matte finish, you'll be like repulsed by things like this. So you want to look at a matte detailer. The same idea, it brings the finish up amazing, gets rid of all those fingerprints and dust and grease marks on it, uh, but it keeps and retains that matte finish. So again, these are for the, you know, these aren't for everyone. These, these are for people that really want to do the fine detailing on a bike. And the last one, uh, the last word actually, in detailing, metal polish. Now, if you've got a bike that's got polished finish on it, or you've got polished parts, or perhaps you've done a bit of aftermarket, sort of um, done a bit of fettling to your bike, you've taken off the polish on, uh, or the finish on your pedals, for example, and you've sheened them up. It was something we used to do a lot in the 90s, get the Dremel out and make it polish. That stuff brings it up like a mirror. Uh, obviously, there's loads of different metal polishes on the market. There's Autosol, there's all sorts of different things. Uh, one of the merits about this particular one is it doesn't leave a white residue. So uh, if that's something that bugs you and you're into polishing, you're probably not. 
not, but if you are, that's pretty good stuff by all accounts. Um, like I said, this is uh, the last word. Most of you won't even be looking at this stuff. You'll be looking at the stuff to clean your bike, to drive out the moisture and lubricate the chain. That is really, like I said from the beginning, the fundamentals, and that's what we all need. All the rest of the stuff, if you're really into those deeper jobs, then these products are definitely gonna help you. In particular, those suspension greases, the press fit retaining compound, I can't live without that stuff. Uh, I think it's a godsend really, as far as bike lubricants and components and things like that go. Um, Ask away some questions if we haven't sort of given you enough info here. If there's some more specifics or there's some jobs you want to see us do using some of these things uh, to demonstrate how you use them, uh, let us know in those comments. As always, thank you for watching. I hope this was useful. It's just trying to break down all of the products available out there. A uh, bit of a buyer's guide, I guess you could call it that. Um, let us know what you think. And thanks again, as always. See you later.